After the Second World War, New York City authorities retained rent control, supposedly to help their poorer citizens. The intentions were good. This in the Bronx was one result. By the 50s, the same authorities were taxing their citizens, including those who live in the Bronx and other devastated areas beyond the East River, to subsidize public housing. Another idea with good intentions. Yet poor people are paying for this, subsidized apartments for the well-to-do. When government at city or federal level spends our money to help us, strange things happen. The idea that government had to protect us came to be accepted during the terrible years of the Depression. Capitalism was said to have failed, and politicians were looking for a new approach. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a candidate for the presidency. He was governor of New York State. At the governor's mansion in Albany, he met repeatedly with friends and colleagues to try to find some way out of the Depression. The problems of the day were to be solved by government action and government spending. The measures that FDR and his associates discussed here derive from a long line of past experience. Some of the roots of these measures go back to Bismarck's Germany at the end of the 19th century, the first modern state to institute old age pensions and other similar measures on the part of government. In the early 20th century, Great Britain followed suit under Lloyd George and Churchill. It too instituted old age pensions and similar plans. These precursors of the modern welfare state had little effect on practice in the United States, but they did have a very great effect on the intellectuals on the campus, like those who gathered here with FDR. The people who met here had little personal experience of the horrors of the Depression, but they were confident that they had the solution. In their long discussions as they sat around this fireplace, trying to design programs to meet the problems raised by the worst Depression in the history of the United States, they quite naturally drew upon the ideas that were prevalent at the time. The intellectual climate had become one in which it was taken for granted that government had to play a major role in solving the problems, in providing what came later to be called security from cradle to grave. Roosevelt's first priority after his election was to deal with massive unemployment. A public works program was started. The government financed projects to build highways, bridges, and dams. The National Recovery Administration was set up to revitalize industry. Roosevelt wanted to see America move into a new era. The Social Security Act was passed and other measures followed. Unemployment benefits, welfare payments, distribution of surplus food. With these measures, of course, came rules, regulations, and red tape, as familiar today as they were novel then. The government bureaucracy began to grow and it's been growing ever since. This is just a small part of the Social Security Empire today. Their headquarters in Baltimore has 16 rooms this size. All these people are dispensing our money with the best possible intentions. But at what cost? In the 50 years since the Albany meetings, we have given government more and more control over our lives and our income. In New York State alone, these government buildings house 11,000 bureaucrats, administering government programs that cost New York taxpayers $22 billion. At the federal level, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare alone has a budget larger than any government in the world, except only Russia and the United States. Yet these government measures often do not help the people they are supposed to. Richard Brown's daughter, Halima, needs constant medical attention. She has a throat defect, 
and has to be connected to a breathing machine so that she'll survive the nights. It's expensive treatment, and you might expect the family to qualify for a Medicaid grant. No, I don't get it, because I'm not eligible for it. I make a few dollars too much, and the salary that I make, I, I can't afford to really live and save anything. That's out of the question. And I mean, I live, we live from payday to payday. I mean, literally from payday to payday. The struggle isn't made any easier by the fact that Mr. Brown knows that if he gave up his job as an orderly at the Harlem Hospital, he would qualify for a government handout, and he'd be better off financially. Oh, Miss Davis. Um, Mr. Brown, can we say this, please? Mm -hmm. There's a section patient. It's a terrible pressure on him, but he's proud of the work that he does here, and he's strong enough to resist the pressure. Mr. Brown, uh, and you're fully dilated, so I'm here to take you to the delivery room. Try not to push. Please, because you want to have a nice, sterile delivery. Okay. Mr. Brown has found out the hard way okay? that welfare right. programs destroy an individual's independence. We have considered welfare. And, uh, we went to see if I'd apply for welfare, but we were told that we were only eligible for $5 a month. And, uh, and to, to receive this $5, we would have to uh, cash in our son's savings bonds. And that, that's not even worth it. I don't believe in something for nothing anyway. I think a lot of people are capable of working and are willing to work. But it's, it's just the way it's set up. It, um, the, the mother and the children are better off if the husband isn't working or if the husband isn't there. And this breaks up so many poor families. One of the saddest things is that many of the children whose parents are on welfare will in their turn end up in the welfare trap when they grow up. In this public housing project in the Bronx, New York, three quarters of the families are now receiving welfare payments. Well, Mr. Brown wanted to keep away from this kind of thing for a very good reason. The people who get on welfare lose their human independence and feeling of dignity. They become subject to the dictates and whims of their welfare supervisor who can tell them whether they can live here or there, whether they may put in a telephone, what they may do with their lives. They're treated like children, not like responsible adults. And they're trapped in the system. Maybe a job comes up that looks better than welfare, but they're afraid to take it because if they lose it after a few months, it may be six months or nine months before they can get back onto welfare. And as a result, this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle rather than simply a temporary state of affairs. Things have gone even further elsewhere. This is a Hume Estate, a public housing project in Manchester, England. Well, we're 3,000 miles away from the Bronx here, but you'd never know it just by looking around. It looks as if we're at the same place. It's the same kind of flats, same kind of massive housing units, decrepit, even though they were only built seven or eight years ago, vandalism, graffiti, the same feeling about the place of people who don't have a great deal of drive and energy because somebody else is taking care of their day-to-day -day needs because the state has deprived them of an incentive to find jobs to become responsible people to be the real supports of themselves and their families. For the past seven years, Maureen Ramsey has had to buy food and clothes for her family out of a government handout. For the whole of that time, her husband, Steve, hasn't had a job. Each week, he collects what's known in Britain as Social Security. The government looks after him, his wife, and their children. <coughs> but accepting welfare payments means accepting the rules of those who hand them out. My opinion, anyway. You feel as they own you. You know, there's no other way of putting it. Say, I got a job tomorrow because I needed something. Well, I know that I've got to go down there and report it. Because I couldn't go into the job because you'd be looking over your shoulder thinking, oh, the Social Security's coming in. I'm going to be done for it. It's, ju it's just hopeless. You can't fight against it. The jobs around now these days, you only come up with about £45 a week. And then you need a doctor's stamp out of there. You still finish up with about £39. So what good is he working? When you, you still get the same thing, you know what I mean? 
I can't see any sense of it. Of course, he's quite right that it may not pay him uh, to get a job now. That's not his fault, and I don't blame him. He's acting sensibly and intelligently for his own interest and the interest of his family. It's the fault of a system which takes away the incentive from him to get a job. But suppose you were cruel and simply took away the welfare overnight, cut it off. What would happen? He would find a job. What kind of a job? I don't know. It would, might not be a very nice job. It might not be a very attractive job. But at some wage, at some level of pay, there will always be a job which he could get for himself. It might be also that he would be driven to rely on some private charity. He might have to get soup kitchen help or the equivalent. Again, I'm not saying that's desirable or nice or a good thing. It isn't. But as a matter of actual fact as to what would happen, there is little doubt that he would find some way to earn a living. The American government is trying to break the welfare trap. These people were unemployed. They're now being trained at the taxpayer's expense. It may or may not lead to a real job. Here we have a vast national welfare system, which is diametrically opposed to everything that America believes in. Because America was founded on a work ethic, uh, has practiced the work ethic, and has said this is what we want everybody to do, the opportunity to hold a job in, in America. Everyone here has to clock in and do a full day's work. It's an attempt to make it seem like a real job. We're saying a job is a part of the American way of life, and we're going to help you find a job so that you can get a piece of the pie, you can pay taxes, you can become a, uh, a part of that American dream. But the dream isn't working. Schemes like this, run under the government's Comprehensive Education and Training Act, CETA, have a high dropout rate, and many trainees end up back where they began, on welfare. The men and women who administer CETA and similar programs, the officials of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, are dedicated people. Their motives are good. Their achievements are not. The results of these programs have been disappointing. Why? I believe that the basic reason it is, is because it is very hard to achieve good objectives through bad means. And the means we have been using are bad in two very different respects. In the first place, all of these programs involve some people spending other people's money for objectives that are determined by still a third group of people. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Nobody has the same dedication to achieving somebody else's objectives that he displays when he pursues his own. Beyond this, the programs have a insidious effect on the moral fiber of both the people who administer the programs and the people who are supposedly benefiting from it. For the people who administer it, it instills in them a feeling of almost godlike power. For the people who are supposedly benefiting, it instills a feeling of childlike dependence. Their capacity for personal decision-making atrophies. The result is that the programs involve a misuse of money. They do not achieve the objectives which it was their intention to achieve. But far more important than this, they tend to rot, rot away the very fabric that holds a decent society together. The figure of if you think that's overstating the case, look what HEW found when it made a special investigation into the spending of the vast funds it administers. We just uh, got the plan from the Public Health Service on reducing unnecessary beds. In these reels of tape that record every payment made, every recipient, they found evidence that a staggering seven and a half billion dollars had been lost by fraud, waste, and abuse in one year. Doctors, building contractors, hospitals, schools, welfare recipients, 
everyone had been fraudulently dipping into the pot, and the investigation isn't over yet. The inevitable consequence of having a huge pot of taxpayers' money is that all of us want to get our hands in it. You can be sure that we'll all be able to find very good reasons why we should be the ones to spend somebody else's money. Somebody or other put up a good case for spending taxpayers' money to subsidize rents in New York City, including the rents of these apartments. The people who occupy these apartments pay something like $200 a month less than the market rent. And that subsidy comes out of the taxes of people, most of whom are much poorer than the people who live here. It's not unusual for this sort of thing to happen when government tries to do good with our money. Look at what happened in Chicago. For most visitors, the immediate impression is of a rich, prosperous, bustling city. But like every large city in America, it has its problem areas. Overcrowded slums breeding poverty and crime. After World War II, one such area developed in Hyde Park. In the 50s, plans were drawn up to pull down large areas of slum building and to rebuild using government funds under an urban renewal program. It was to be a show project, replacing a blighted area with an integrated community. Who controlled the spending of that government money? It was, in fact, my own University of Chicago which felt its very existence threatened by the spread of urban blight and crime. Government money was used to tear down an area that contained many small shops as well as families of low income. Once the area was cleared, private money rebuilt it with middle-class apartments, townhouses, and shopping complexes. The blight had been cleared here, but only to be shifted elsewhere. In many instances, when, when government administers large grants, a lot of those funds don't wind up directly uh, serving the people and achieving the objectives that, that were the intent of the programs because you, the, the, the grant has to feed that large government bureaucracy. Joe Gardner helped to set up an organization of local black people to protect their own inners. Previously, the blacks had rioted in the streets to try to get their way. Now it was to be done peacefully using government money. When government funds became available, the Woodlawn organization got control. They used them to build the kind of houses they wanted, low-rise apartments like these. The bureaucrats, planners, and architects told them that it was uneconomical, that only high-rise blocks would work. They were wrong. A lot of people have this, this view that uh, the disadvantaged, if you will, have no idea of what their problems are and how to resolve them, that it takes outside professionals to do that. And we say that's baloney because the outside professional does not feel in his gut what a uh, woman on welfare with six kids uh, living off $100 a month in a, in a, in a uh, deteriorated building feels. She can come up with solutions much better than a bureaucrat. The intentions of this local community group are good. They want to rebuild the community as the community wants. I said, are you pretty pleased with the work we're doing? Yes, I am. Very pleased with it. But government money always corrupts. Look at the number of people rebuilding this garage. It doesn't make sense, except that these are CETA workers paid for by taxpayers' money. Government funds have allowed the organization to take over a whole area of Chicago. They now have their own supermarket. They've built splendid houses for middle-class occupiers, very expensive, protected by the latest security systems, all at the taxpayer's expense.
in a sense, TWO is rapidly becoming a mini government. At this particular point, we have approximately 400 employees. Uh, we have an operating budget of uh, in excess of $5 million a year. So we are large. Large and expanding. Their next project is to redevelop this site. And that's only the first step in a 20-year plan that will cost $220 million, most of it coming from the taxpayers. In the South Bronx, they're very familiar with government protection, like the rent controls that made it uneconomic for landlords to maintain their buildings. They've moved out and the vandals have moved in. The South Bronx is an area where many of the people are on welfare and where the crime rate is high. But all this could change. A group of local people has begun to renovate these buildings to build new homes. They call themselves Sweat Equity because at first sweat and effort was all they could put into the project. Only later did they accept a small government grant. How long ago did you start working on this building? Four months ago. On this building, right here. And I take it what you're going to do is gut the whole thing from beginning to end? Right, totally gut it. And you'll have to rewire the wire, put new walls up, new floors, new ceilings, new everything. Worked in the winter, worked in the summer, yeah. worked when I had the chance to work. How many people have you got working here? A good 40 people. How do you keep them working? <laughs> you know, some of them must want to get tired of, of course, it and of pull course. off and so on. So well, how do you... Try to keep them interested. We, we show them what could be done in the future, what will be done in the future. Mm -hmm. And they get, they get, well, at first, it's kind of hard to prove to somebody that in the next three, four years, what will come out of it. They can't see it in the long range term. Mm -hmm. They only see it in the short run. They need sure. money right now, and that in two or three years. Sure. So we, we try to show them that it will happen. It's true they now accept some government money. But so far, they've managed to retain their original philosophy that the best way to get something done well is to do it yourself. Okay, like what we're doing, we're bringing people out of the street, giving them something to look forward to. They have their own apartment, they'll be taking care of the area around it, they have a garden, they have something to look forward to. They can even get off welfare, we can even get them a job. So they can drop the welfare and have some self-pride. That's the whole thing about it, self-pride. So as long as you collect it from the government and sitting back, you have no worries. We're not sitting back, we're working. We're, we're making that money come in. And we're putting it into our building. We're, we're building ourselves up as well as the building. Some of these people are CETA workers, paid for by the taxpayer. But this isn't as useful as it might appear. You ask these fellows, which would they rather have, the CETA workers or the money that's being paid to the CETA workers? <laughs> which would you rather have? The money paid to the, the CETA workers. <laughs> that's your answer? But that's very expensive help. In terms of very what these people could use with the money, you give these people the amount of money you're paying to that CETA workers, and I'll bet they'll have twice as much, three times as much work. Am I wrong? You're right. You're right. Exactly. So that's a very inefficient way to use their money. The problem is you've got a bureaucracy and the government right. bureaucrats, they want to decide what to do. They don't want to let you decide what exactly. to do. Exactly. Ask yourself, how did this place get built up in the first place? After all, this was a pretty respectable, solid, substantial region when it was first developed. It wasn't done through a government project. It was done by people individually having an incentive to put up these buildings and occupy them. What these people we've been seeing here are doing is they're trying to restore that feeling and that attitude. You'll have a far healthier community here if it grows out of the self-help of people like the people we've been talking to than if it's a paternalistic venture undertaken by governmental civil servants and bureaucrats who have to plan on a large scale for other people. We must find a way to give everyone caught in the welfare trap the kind of initiative these people have. The best, or should I say the least bad solution I have ever been able to devise is something called the negative income tax. This is the idea that uh, we should get rid of a large part of the welfare bureaucracy and of the demeaning rules, that we should help people who are poor fundamentally by giving them money. With the positive income tax, you're entitled to a certain amount of personal exemptions and deductions, and above that amount you pay tax. But suppose you have no income. 
Under a negative income tax, a fraction of your unused exemptions would be paid to you by the government, guaranteeing at least a minimum income. If you earned something, you'd still get a fraction of your unused exemptions, and you'd end up better off. As your earnings rose, the supplement to your income would become smaller and smaller until your earnings equaled your exemptions. At that point, you'd break even, neither paying tax nor receiving a subsidy. It's not an ideal system. It's not the system we might have liked to get into. But it's a system which would have the effect of eliminating the separation of the society into those who receive and those who pay a separation that tends to destroy the whole social fabric. It would mean that we, that we could each of us take advantage of opportunities that opened up without fearing that if by some chance we lost our jobs, it would be a long time before we could get back on assistance. It would be a system that would give all of us an incentive gradually to improve our lives, would perhaps enable us over time to work ourselves out of the kind of mess we've gotten ourselves into. A mess we've gotten ourselves into for the very best of motives, but with the very worst of results. We have become increasingly dependent on government. We have surrendered power to government. Nobody has taken it from us. It's our doing. The results? Monumental government spending. Much of it wasted. Little of it going to the people whom we would like to see helped. Burdensome taxes, high inflation, a welfare system under which neither those who receive help nor those who pay for it are satisfied. Trying to do good with other people's money simply has not worked. The discussion is already underway here at the University of Chicago, so let's join it. As I looked at the film, I had a growing sense of anger. Anger that that position failed to recognize that the system that was being attacked was necessary in our capitalistic free enterprise system that by its own failure produces poverty and therefore requires governmental intervention in the interest of those people caught in the traps of poverty. So as I sat and looked at the film and as I hear Dr. Friedman's statement, uh, I was aroused uh, to the point, as I said, of, of anger because only half the story is told. We are really blaming again a victim, this time a system, the welfare system, for the failure of other systems to operate in the interest of people. Let's get other reactions out of that statement. Trying to do good with other people's money simply has not worked. The welfare system is rotting away the very fabric of society. Tom Saul. My reaction was just the opposite. Uh, my anger was at what had been created in the city where I grew up under very different conditions during the period of capitalistic failure, during the period when there wasn't this humanitarianism and where it was possible for people to live better and to get out of that poverty. Now I think someone living in the very same place where I live would find it much harder to escape from that poverty because of all these things. Buildings were not abandoned like the buildings that we saw in that film when I lived in Harlem. Uh, the crime rate, the, all the things that are blamed upon the failures of the previous method uh, did not exist. Uh, I slept out on the fire escapes in Harlem. I would defy anybody to do that in any part of New York City today. Traditionally, uh, in the United States, we have tried to avoid some of the welfare trap that was referred to by denying eligibility to people who are able-bodied and uh, not aged and uh, so on. Uh, and we have therefore tried to uh, close the welfare door to a good number of categories within the poor uh, population. The second point that was emphasized uh, and I think needs to be put in some perspective is that some but not all of what we might call welfare programs broadly have this uh, very strong take back of benefits as you earn some more money. And uh, that, I guess, is what uh, I would like to single out as the principal problem identified in the film, but it is not common to any and all welfare programs that one might think of. When the family fails, when the private sector fails to create jobs at a fast enough rate, you find that people are unemployed and drift into needing help in order to exist. 
and the welfare system was created in the 30s to do exactly that. When the private sector essentially failed, we have the development of a welfare system. It is not corrupting society. It is taking what society institutions have left behind. The family breaking up, the economy not expanding fast enough, the health system failing, the educational system not doing its job. We have untrained, unskilled people looking for jobs in a highly technical society or jobs that pay so low that people cannot, in fact, live in a decent level of humanity. Uh, I see the welfare system not corrupting, but in fact taking the remains and attempting to help people live in dignity. So rotting away the fabric of society is not supported, except perhaps by you, would you back that phrase? Absolutely. So? Yeah. Uh, you're saying, you're talking about the failures of the other parts of society. What the welfare system and other kinds of governmental programs are doing is paying people to fail. In so far as they fail, they receive the money. In so far as they succeed, even to a moderate extent, the money is taken away. This is even extended into the school systems, where they will give money to schools with low scores. Uh, in so far as the school improves its education, the money is taken away so that you are subsidizing people to fail in their own private lives and become more dependent upon the handouts. We have expectations built in today about the quality of life, the quality of job, uh, the level of income for which one expects in return. Why? Because we look at the level around us that it takes us to have no, a fairly decent why. level. Of no, that's not why. Uh, I may have all sorts of expectations. The question is, what can I do? If someone else is subsidizing my expectations, my expectations will be far higher. Uh, insofar as the Center for Advanced Study was subsidizing my expectations a few years ago, I refused to work at UCLA for the normal full professor's salary. Why should I when I can get the same money for being at the Center for Advanced Study with no hours, no duties, and no classes? <laughs> Let's look at another proposition in Milton's uh, case the insidious effect on those who receive welfare. They lose their human independence and dignity, are treated like children, and so on. Now, Dr. Dumson, as a former administrator of a major program, is that a great hazard? That is not a great hazard. As a matter of fact, that presumes that people get on welfare, stay on welfare, and therefore have the result that Dr. Friedman's statement issues. The fact of the matter is that in our AFTC programs throughout the country, in particular, it was this true in New York, there is a, a turnover of the welfare AFTC roles. About a third of them go off each year. Now, if these people were so destroyed by the system, when they go off, they wouldn't go into employment, they wouldn't hold employment, they wouldn't stay off the roles for six months, 18 months, 24 months, as long as they are able to stay off. So there's something wrong with that argument when one looks at people and what they do. People, you know, who are poor, are no different from those of us who are not poor. And their motivation for self-dependency, self-support, and mobility in the economic scale is no different than those of our, than the motives we have. So that they will not let the system, you remember, Dr. Friedman, the welfare rights organizations, who refused to let the system squelch them down as it was attempting to do. And you we and turned I, the policies know, around. You and I agree completely that the people who are poor and are on welfare rolls are no different from the rest of us. Of course not. They are human beings and they deserve every sympathy and every possibility of making their own way. But the welfare system makes them different. But you give them it makes it in their interest to be how different. How do you account uh, for them going off the rolls? And, uh, and it's oh, but based. figures are figures and you've got to be careful with figures. The fact that a third, uh, there's a turnover of, of a third, does not mean that there aren't half who are on all the time. People come on, go off, come on, go off. Time, We've latest, got to have the other figure. The latest which statistic, is the Dr. Friedman, fraction is that 34% of the people on AFDC are on for five years or longer. And when one thinks of the purpose of the AFDC right. program, which was the rearing and support of children, dependent children, minor children, I would submit to you that five years is not a terribly long time for a mother and children to have to be dependent if there's no other source of income. I think the other data, uh, we have a program in Pennsylvania for essentially all of those who are not taken care of by the AFDC program. It's called a general assistance program. And there, uh, less than 15% are on more than 18 months. So we have a great turnover. We have essentially young males uh, moving into the welfare system after unemployment compensation and then moving out uh, when a job opportunity comes along. This, I, you know, I think the notion of, of, of generations of people on welfare is, is a very small minority uh, in the whole system. 
That doesn't mean that the system as presently defined uh, and as the, as the set of programs that we have put together don't often contradict each other. And I'm the first to uh, agree with, with Dr. Friedman that some of the programs are conflicting. However, I think it is, it is uh, overly broad to say that uh, we turn people into helpless children. I don't remember talking to anyone who's ever been on welfare who didn't think they were being treated like children while they were on it. Of course, I, you know, you, one must make a difference, a distinction between the system that was set up to help people and the people who are employed in that system. Look at any public welfare system around the country and we have no practically few trained people to work with people. We employ the ill-trained, people who are not equipped to be helping people. We say they're social workers. They're not social workers. They have neither the skills, the attitudes, and some of them not even the concern. So I think one has to separate out a conceptual framework of a system designed to help people and what the, the country and community puts into that system to implement those programs. You mean separate the hopes from the reality? I separate the skills that are available in order to implement what the objectives of the program are. And I think we have to separate whether we're talking about program objectives or we're talking about how it operates. I would be the first to say that the system that I administered had ill-prepared people to do the job that we were set up to do. But I would not say that the system that we set up... I talk to some social welfare people who think that, in fact, they were so hamstrung by the system that there was very little they could do to help people to get off welfare, that is, to, to build up skills, get jobs, do whatever was necessary to get off welfare. They felt it was the system. Bob Lappin, you well, the comment. system that we're stereotyping is uh, one of a great deal of paternalistic interference in individual families' lives. And in fact, isn't this true, uh, Mr. Dumpson, uh, the caseload is so high for an individual welfare worker that they can't do a lot of interfering in individual family lives. Moreover, uh, in the last decade, there's been a real attempt to uh, ease this welfare trap uh, in AFDC by changing the take-back rate and by administering uh, work expenses and child care expenses in such a way as to uh, facilitate work by those who may want to do it. So it's, it's not quite as harsh a picture as we sometimes get, that, uh, that there is this omniscient welfare worker who's right there in the living room with the family making all their decisions for them. I've well, never we, heard of a government program which uh, was defective, in which the people who ran it didn't say, if only we had more money to spend on what we're not being able to accomplish with the amount we're spending now. Milton, I'm going to move on now to some of your prescriptions in that film because <coughs> I think it's good ground for discussion. The most drastic one was when you said, speaking of an unemployed man, supposing you were cruel and took away welfare from this man, he would find a job in some, at some wage, there would always be a job he could get, he might need some charity en route, private charity, but he would get a job. Now I want you to react, those of you, before we come back to Milton on that, is that a picture that seems plausible to you? First he may get a job, but he will get, may get a job in what we refer to as the underground economy. And that's where a number of our youth are now going to get their jobs. Those activities that are illegal, and the only opportunity they have for earning a part of a livelihood. I think the other issue is that you have a whole group of people who are the single female head of a household. And yes, cut off welfare tomorrow. What will they do? What will be their immediate response? At what price to their small children and to their uh, uh, middle-aged children? Uh, yes, they'll get a job. In fact, the statistics show that women, in fact, are the most successful through the Absolutely. employment program. But what has to supplement that, typically, is the provision of some kind of daycare arrangement. Either the individual woman has to earn enough money to be able to pay privately for her daycare, or in fact she is, quote, subsidized through this insidious uh, corrupting program, set of programs run by the federal government, which in fact makes her employable and a taxpayer. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, notion of trying to get people in a productive mode. Tom Sowell. It's incredible the, the, the way you start the story in the middle, uh, as if there's a predestined amount of poverty, a predestined amount of unemployment, and that the welfare system is not itself in any way responsible there for that. There is a predestined 20% of the bottom half of the population. I, I have never, oh, well, nonsense. that's always been true. There's I, going I, to be 20% at the bottom. Agree with you, with you. <laughs> it's also true that 20% of the bottom population doesn't have to be living on the government and ruled by the government. You mentioned, for 
example, the female headed household. Many of those, in addition to the, the grown woman who has all the, all the kids, are teenage pregnancies. Uh, there's not a predestined amount of teenage pregnancy. I grew up in an era when people, and particularly blacks, were a lot poorer than today, faced a lot more discrimination than today, and in which the teenage pregnancy rate was a lot lower than today. I don't believe there is a predestined amount of teenage pregnancy, a predestined amount of husband desertion. Uh, the, uh, Gutman has done a study of the black family showing that this whole notion that this is, the black family has always been disintegrating, that that is nonsense, that his, his studies go up to 1925, the great bulk of black families were intact, two-parent families up through 1925, and going all the way back through the era of slavery. So it is now only within our own time that we suddenly see this inevitable tragedy which the welfare system says it's going to rush into solve, well, but which it is itself a, a part. We're talking about a very small group. We're talking about 12% of the families are not intact are not two-parent families at any one you period mean, of time. Uh, I mean among welfare recipients no, or the among the at pu large? public at large. We're talking about 12% of the families. 12%. That's right. That's a small number. But well, there's still those on welfare. We're still talking about a significant component of the bottom 20% that are the bottom 20%. Whether they are above the poverty line or below the poverty line, they are still the bottom 20%. And the issue is, what is the responsibility of the other 80%, if any? Does, those does your program plan to eliminate their being a bottom 20%? No, but it intends to raise the bottom 20%. So you're raising them by having, more, by having more illegitimacy, more unemployment. That's I'm not making them, be, them have illegitimate children. Uh, I hope uh, that's clear. Oh, I, I think, <laughs> oh, you, don't, you don't have to do that. You simply subsidize it. We as human beings don't have a responsibility, but I hope we have a compassion and an interest in the bottom 20%. And I only want to say to you, that the capitalist system, the private enterprise system in the 19th century did a far better job of expressing that sense of compassion than the governmental welfare programs are today. The 19th century, the period which people denigrate as a high tide of capitalism, had the, was a period of the greatest outpouring of eleemosynary and charitable activity that the world has ever known. And one of the things I hold against the welfare system most seriously is that it has destroyed private charitable arrangements which are far more effective, far more compassionate, far more person to person in helping people who are really, for no fault of their own, in disadvantaged situations. I have to disagree with you though, because I think that the, uh, the whole notion of private property was excluded. Uh, whole segments of society were excluded from the notion of private property in the 19th century, namely women, idiots, and imbeciles. And so I don't go back to the 19th century and hold that up as any paragon that we would want to uh, replicate today. Anyway, I want Milton now to come to your major prescription, which I know you don't say is on the agenda for tomorrow, but it lies ahead. That is the negative income tax. And I'm not sure people fully understand how it would work. We can't, I think, go into the details of it, but I'd like to get a reaction around the uh, panel, first of all. Is this a viable approach to the enduring problems of poverty? Negative income tax. I, I think it's a, a viable approach to some part of the problems of poverty. Um, it involves, uh, first of all, cash payments rather than in-kind payments, as I understand it. It involves payments on a non-categorical basis. What do you mean non-categorical? Uh, that is to say, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a female-headed family or a male-headed family or whether you're young or old, uh, whether you're sick or well. If your income falls uh, below a certain level, you... It does you... pay some guaranteed income level for people based on family size, and then it has a take-back rate, uh, which is modest, I suppose, by definition. Now, uh, the question is how many things you want to use that program to replace? Um, how many things you want to replace with such a negative income tax program? Would you replace and, everything uh, with, just to so clear that yeah. point up, would you virtually wipe out the remaining forms of welfare if you got this program going? Yes, I would not. Be, I, I think its purpose is precisely to provide a transition between where we are now and where we would like to go because while, uh, because I agree with you, that given that we've corrupted the people on welfare and gotten them on there, we do have an obligation not to throw them out in the street and put them in the difficult adjustment you've made. We've got to ease, the, yeah, okay, ease fine, it off. Sure. And so, yep. But I would want to replace all yep. present okay. welfare programs. Now let's get reactions to this and we'll come back to you. Well, I, I, I saw some figures recently uh, which said that if you took all the money spent on poverty in the United States and divided it by all the poverty family, you came, you'd come up with a figure of $32,000 per family. Uh, now, the average poverty family apparently is not getting the $32,000. Uh, and so clearly someone in between uh, the Treasury and those families is getting an awful lot of that money. And I think that if you simply uh, eliminated the middleman, as they say in the, in the commercials, uh, that there'd be an awful lot of benefit both to the poor and to the taxpayers. I'm so supportive 
of the negative income tax concept and, and the objective of it. I'd like to point out, however, that administratively we have another um, bureaucracy set up. Somebody has to take into account earnings. Absolutely. Someone has to decide when to pay back that which they're entitled to. There's a time lag between the paying back, the, the earning and the paying back. There are a variety of problems in there that I will be prepared to accept, but I want you to know that government intervention is not going to be eliminated. The issue that I have is where do children come in? What are their rights under a negative income tax? And are we, by building in a negative income tax, in fact, subsidizing uh, the illegitimacy that Tom Sowell is so concerned about? The major reason it is not feasible today to have a negative income tax is because the present welfare bureaucracy would be out of work. They are the major objectors, as pa uh, Senator Pat, and now he's now a senator, Pat Moynihan, then demonstrated in his book on the Nixon program. The chief obstacle to getting it enacted was a welfare bureaucracy. So that I don't believe these administrative problems, if you got it enacted, would be at all serious. I think the other assumption under the negative income tax, and it's one that uh, I'm not sure I can buy, is that everybody has a minimum level of, of understanding about how to spend money. In other words, how to use the marketplace to satisfy wishes. And, and I, as an economist, could say, yes, we do. We, ev everybody from age four to uh, 100 knows how to use money to satisfy wants. And that's, that's, but the, they don't. that's the premise. But they don't. There are all the sorts of problems business. of people who are not going to be able to. But that's a minority problem. That's a problem for private activity and private charity. One thing is sure. They're spending, they would be spending their own money, and that however knowledgeable you are about they how to spend... They would be spending my money. They, I, they would be spending my, my money, but it would be one stage less bad. Right now, the welfare worker is spending Mr. A's money to help Mr. C. And there's a big takeoff in the middle, as Tom Sowell said. The question is not whether people on welfare or on low incomes can all spend their money effectively. The question is, how effectively do they spend it as compared to how effectively the bureaucrats spend it for them? Right. Comparing anything to, per to perfection uh, or to some arbitrary standard uh, s settles nothing. The same thing is true in the education area. They're saying, would families be able to send their select schools for their kids under a voucher system, for example? Well, the question is, could they possibly do much worse than the current bureaucrats are doing in, in, the, in the public school system? Oh, we're going on education in another program. Bob Lamp, Bob Lamp. <laughs> I want to quibble with something you said, Tom, uh, about half of the money uh, not going to the poor or something. Uh, that doesn't, uh, shouldn't lead the uh, viewer to think that all that money is going to the administrators of programs. A lot of what you're talking about goes to non-poor recipients. For example, Social Security as a program pays a roughly half of its benefits to people who otherwise would not be poor. Unemployment insurance pays about two-thirds of its benefits or so to non-poor persons. And those are, in some definitions, welfare or anti-poverty programs. And that's how statisticians come up with this horrendous-sounding discrepancy between the total amount of money spent and the total cash benefits that go to the poor. Well, I think, I think it's a perfectly valid point, though, uh, because supposedly we were not setting up unemployment mm -hmm. benefits and Social Security in order to keep the affluent affluent. Well, this goes back to this big philosophy uh, debate we might have. I think it's easy to oversimplify things and say that all of these programs, including the public schools, are there to be of help to the poor and the poor only. Yeah, but I will but say let me mention that the negative income tax has some of its impetus in that it would be a way of confining benefit payments to people who are yes. income poor. Yes, absolutely. And it would cut out benefits for absolutely. an awful lot of people who now have expectations that they're going to get them, not in the form of public assistance, but in the form of social insurance as we use the... the or an argument could be made for not disappointing the expectations on which people have built their lives for one generation, but not have continued for eternity in order to avoid one generation of transition. What are the other hurdles to it getting underway? Now you said, uh, I don't know how seriously, the biggest, almost the only hurdle is the welfare bureaucracy. No, no, they're the, they're the biggest no. immediate group of lobbyists that will lobby against it. Yeah. The biggest hurdle to getting it over at the moment is that there is no way of constructing a sensible negative income tax system that will not hurt some people. There will be some people who will get less money than they are now getting under it, particularly those in the upper income groups, particularly the affluent who are now being subsidized by the welfare. And they will make it politically difficult for the people to put it into effect. The, the attempt is to put a negative income tax in effect, which costs less money, is easier to administer, 
and yet which doesn't pay anybody in the society one dollar less than he's now getting. There's no way in which you can construct such a program. But although it's not politically feasible now, the force of history is on its side. It's going to become political. Fe Dr. Feasible. Dr. Friedman, Dr. Let's not say that the give the impression that welfare administrators were against the negative income tax, the FAP program, for example, as Moynihan says, because they would lose their jobs, for example. Many of us were opposed to it because of certain features in that program. A $2,400 level for a family of four. We <coughs> were opposed to that. And if one goes down the congressional record, those who testified will be shown to be saying, yes, we're for it conceptually but we're against this piece and this piece. If you change that, you have our support. I was in the same position. I uh, first proposed the negative income tax 25 years ago, but I testified against the final version of the Nixon right. plan. Why? Because the welfare bureaucrats had led them to introduce changes in it which converted it from a decent, satisfactory well, uh, negative income tax to one which would have been just as bad as what you now have. Would have been added on top of everything else. Well, that's, reality. That's, <laughs> it's political reality, that's but right. political reality changes. <coughs> and that's the important thing. I want to say uh, 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 one more thing about this, uh, uh, this whole problem that we've been talking about. And that is, going back to Bob Lampman's comment, there is one thing that can be said in favor of the welfare program unaccustomed as I am to saying anything in favor of it. And that is that it is the only social program I know of which at least on the average gives money to people who are in lower income classes than those who pay the taxes. Every other welfare program, not only does a lot of money go to the people who are well off, but on the average, the poor are, are taxed and the well-to-do are subsidized. We in the upper income classes have been very clever at conning the poor suckers at the bottom to pay us nice salaries as bureaucrats and to provide us with nice benefits at their expense. And at least the welfare program doesn't do that. <laughs> and what you state with great confidence that it will come, the negative income tax, even though you recognize the hurdles. Why are you so sure it will come? Because the present system has within it the seeds of its own destruction. There is no way in which a system constructed like the present, in my opinion, can avoid creating more and more social problems and something is going to have to be done. Nobody has proposed any alternative. So far as I know, there is no effective alternative to the negative income tax. And so it gets knocked down and it keeps rising, it gets knocked down and the, it keeps rising. Yeah, f finally raise the question though, whether in any modern industrial democracy like this one, it's conceivable the system could be run without a fairly elaborate welfare underpinning of some kind. What do you feel, Ms. Bonham? I I don't think uh, it can be because I think essentially the welfare set of welfare programs reflect uh, the values of this society. That if it didn't, there would have been revolt long before now. Yes, there are rumblings about its cost, and I think that's primarily a function of rapid rates of inflation eroding real income earning power of the middle class taxpayer. Uh, but I think. On one level, we wanted to give up the responsibility of caring, the responsibility of day-to-day -day actual caring. And in a technical, modern, industrial society like we have, the tax system and the government system is probably as a, is, is a viable alternative. I don't think we're going to get out of it. I don't think you're going to see private charities who can take my money that I am free to give or not give and essentially make a difference in people's lives of any substance on any level. I don't think that it has anything to do with, the, with society being modern, technological, or industrial. It has to do with an ideology, and particularly an ideology that is very strong among academic intellectuals uh, and in the media. And I think that as time goes on and more and more intelligent ideas replace the kinds of vague visions that dominate today, that the political climate will change, and that's the only thing that stands in the way of reform right now. James Dudson? I don't think you're going to get rid of the system, but I'm interested in a welfare system. I'm interested in Tom's last uh, statement about uh, accommodations and, and, and theorists and so forth. We forget that we're talking about people, and we may sit in the ivory tower and talk about whether this system will work and ideologically or ideologically why it won't work. At the same time, there are masses of people outside who are locked out of the system that you and I are part of. And somehow, we've got to make sure that those people are taken care of. And the short of not doing it, of course, means that your safety and my safety and the, vital the vitality of this government 
and of our country is at stake. The mayor of the city of New York asked me when we had a strike, what would I do if I couldn't get checks out to people uh, when our workers were on strike? And I said to him after the first month, chaos. And he said, what do you mean? I said, no man or woman in the street of the city of New York, you included, Mr. Mayor, will be safe if we cannot take care of people. Well, or there we leave this discussion and hope you'll join us for the next episode of Free to Choose.